Hi, my name is Sandro, and today I'm going to talk to you about higher-order subtyping with type intervals. The talk is going to take us on a meta-theoretic journey, a bit of an odyssey actually, where we'll have to carefully navigate the challenges of different sorts of subtype systems, avoid the pitfalls of inconsistent bounds in the presence of subtyping reflection. It's the stuff of type-theoretic nightmares. So you may wonder, why should I care about higher-order subtyping with type intervals in the first place? To answer that, we'll have to go back a few years, to 2016. For the better part of two decades, Martin Odersky and his team had been working on a solid theoretical foundations for the Scala language. And they were about to make a breakthrough with the dot calculus, a minimal core calculus for Scala's type system. Dot had already been in the making for a few years. But it wasn't until the end of 2015 that the proof of type safety really came together. Dot is a minimal core calculus. It doesn't have all the features of the full Scala language. The idea is that many of the surface features can be encoded into the minimal calculus, which makes the calculus itself easier to reason about and to prove properties of. One of the surface features of the Scala language is its rich, higher kind of type language. It's basically a small functional programming language at the type level itself. And this is one of the bits that we were hoping could be encoded into the dot calculus without having to be in there from the beginning. Dot wasn't just a theoretical project. It was actually the foundation of a new compiler that Martin had been working on for a few years called Dottie, and that has now become the Scala 3 compiler. Dottie is a full-fledged Scala compiler, and so it really needs to support all of the features of Scala. And there's no such thing as a type safety proof for Dottie. But under the hood, it still uses a lot of the ideas of dot. One of the problems, though, is that dot didn't support the rich, higher kind of language of types that Scala supports. But the hope was that these could be encoded in dot. Unfortunately, that didn't turn out to work. So only a few months after the proof of type safety for dot had been published, Martin and the other core developers of the Dottie team published an experience report where they outlined different ways in which they had tried to encode higher kind of types into Dot. None of them had worked. In the end, they were forced to add back higher kind of types into Dottie. And there was again a gap between theory and practice. In this paper, we address this gap and propose a rigorous theory of higher kind of types in Scala. Before we dive into the theoretical details, let's have a look at an example of how higher kind of types are used in practice. Here are two type definitions written in Scala. They're representative of the sort of code that you would find in a standard library. Don't worry about the complexity of this definition. It's very dense and you don't need to understand the details. We'll only use it to illustrate some of the advanced features of Scala's type language. The first thing to notice is that Scala types can take type parameters. They're so-called type operators. Now, Scala is not alone in this. Lots of languages have generic types that take type parameters. But in Scala, you can really write down type functions. For example, the first definition actually defines a type function in much the same way that you would define a term function. Scala methods can take type parameters too, just like functions in other functional programming languages. But Scala implements bounded polymorphism meaning we can enforce constraints on type parameters in the form of lower and upper bounds. In this particular case, the type parameter C has to be a supertype of A and a subtype of B. And because types can take parameters, it's only natural that we would allow bounds on those as well. This is what is called a bounded type operator, and those are actually fairly exotic in the type theoretic literature. Okay. Let's have a closer look at what it actually means to put bounds on a type. Here is the general shape that a declaration of an abstract type X will take in Scala. It can have a lower bound A and an upper bound B. The idea is that whatever the type X turns out to be once it's instantiated, that type will have to have A as a subtype and B as a supertype. Another way of thinking about it is that X is an element of the set of types that are lower bounded by A and upper bounded by B, a sort of interval between A and B. Now this intuition that there's a set of values that a certain expression can take sounds an awful lot like a type itself. 
or rather, because it's a set of type values, a kind. We formalize this idea in our type system f omega int through the notion of interval kinds. You should read the declaration x colon a dot dot b as x is of interval kind a to b, or in other words, x is contained in the interval between a and b. Now, there are other forms of type declarations in Scala, but they're really all special cases of this general template. For example, we can declare a type x that only has an upper bound b, but really, that's just a type x contained in the interval where the lower bound is the bottom type. The bottom type is the minimal type, meaning every other type is a super type of it. And similarly, if x is only declared with a lower bound, that's the same as saying x has this degenerate interval kind that is upper bounded by the top type, the maximum type. Every type is a subtype of top. If a type is declared without any bounds at all, it's just a member of the degenerate interval that goes all the way from bottom to top. We call that interval star, which is the usual notation for the kind of all types. And conversely, if a type is just an alias of another type, then that's the same as saying that it's contained in the interval that is upper bounded and lower bounded by the same type A. This is called a singleton interval or just a singleton kind. What I've shown you so far could really have been expressed in dot already. What's new in f omega int is that we also represent type operators explicitly. So here's the general template of a type operator with one parameter. As before, we can declare bounds on f itself, or in this case, on its body. But we can also declare bounds on its parameter x. This is a bounded operator. In f omega in, such declarations are represented using dependent function kinds. They take types from one interval to another. Here are some examples. First, we can encode aliases of type operators in much the same way that we encoded aliases of proper types. For example, here we have an alias of the type constructor list. It takes a type parameter x and returns an element of the singleton kind that contains just lists of x. Often, we don't want to define aliases. We want to declare abstract type operators with certain bounds. For example, here, the abstract type operator f2 of x is upper bounded by list of x, which means we can instantiate it with a subtype of list of x. For example, a linked list implementation or an array list implementation. Of course, that's not the end of it. f omega int has a rich, higher order type and kind language. So we can encode type operators that have multiple parameters by occurring, that have parameters that are themselves operators, and we can even have type parameters that are bounded operators. Note that in all three type declarations, the codomain of the function kind actually depends on the parameter x. So dependent kinding really is used here. And again, these declarations are fairly representative of what you would find in a Scala standard library, for example, in the collections framework. Now that we have an idea of how bounded operators are represented in f omega int using type intervals, let us take a tour of the main result of our paper, namely the type safety of f omega int. And let's have a look at the challenges involved. As usual for a system that involves subtyping, the main difficulty to proving type safety of f omega int is to prove subtyping inversion. If we're given two arrow types that are related, then we should be able to infer that their domains and codomains are also related and similarly for universal quantifiers. The proof of subtyping inversion in f omega int is complicated by the fact that we have type level computation, but also dependent kinding. One of the main challenges when inverting subtyping in a system with type computation is that in the middle of a subtyping derivation, we may encounter a beta reduction or an eta expansion. Because our system has subkinding, there's a similar problem with subsumption, which can also appear anywhere in a subtyping derivation and thus block simple structural inversion. And finally, we actually have a form of subtyping reflection in f omega int, and this will destroy all the nice structural properties of the subtyping judgment. I won't go into the details of the second challenge in this presentation, but let's have a look at challenge number one and three a little bit closer. The standard declarative subtyping judgment of f omega int is a bit of a monster. 
Besides the usual structural rules for subtyping, it also contains computation rules. And these rules can get in the way of a structural inversion. You can see this in the example judgment on this slide. On the left hand side, there is an arrow type. Then we perform a beta expansion so we get a type application. Then there are some intermediate steps that don't really matter. We get an application again, we beta reduce it, and we end up with an arrow type as well. But there's no telling whether and how these two arrow types are structurally related going through all of these computations. We tame this monster by getting rid of radixes. We introduce a new canonical representation of subtyping where all type expressions are in normal form, and so there are no radixes and no reductions. But this introduces a new challenge because the canonical subtyping judgment requires that everything is in normal form, including kinds. And because we're in a dependently kinded system, kinding involves substitutions, and substitutions don't preserve normal forms. So consider what happens if we're trying to type the following application. We have a type operator that's abstract, it's just a type variable, and we want to apply it to another type that is in normal form. The kind of the resulting application is the codomain k with the normal form v substituted for x. Even if k was a normal form, the resulting kind expression with the substitution doesn't need to be. We solve this particular problem by using something called hereditary substitution for the canonical judgment. Unlike ordinary substitutions, hereditary substitutions beta reduce and eta expand their results. You can find the details in the paper. The third challenge is of a somewhat different nature. Like dot, f omega int features a form of subtyping reflection. Programmers can introduce custom subtyping rules into the subtyping judgment via type intervals. This is a really powerful type system feature, and it can be used for good, but it also has a dark side, because we can reflect inconsistent subtyping rules into the subtyping judgment and break type safety. Let's have a look at an example to see how this works. Let's assume I've declared an abstract type x with the following bounds in my program. The lower bound is the type top, and the upper bound is the type bottom. These bounds are absurd, because of course the top type is not a subtype of the bottom type, it's the other way around. But hey, it's a declaration, and we can declare any bounds we want. Now because top is a lower bound of x, we can derive that it's also a subtype of x. And because top is a supertype of every other type, any type whatsoever by transitivity is a subtype of x. But x also has bottom as an upper bound, which means that x is a subtype of bottom. And because bottom is a subtype of every other type, any type whatsoever is a supertype of x. And so by transitivity, any type is a subtype of any other type we want. The subtyping relation becomes trivial, and we can relate types with completely different type constructors. So inversion is never going to work. This is not the only bad news, I'm afraid. Reflection of inconsistent bounds really breaks a lot of things. For example, subject reduction or preservation of types under reduction doesn't hold in general. And subtyping becomes undecidable, which we prove in the paper. The solution to this problem is basically to ignore it. We're just not going to attempt to prove subtyping inversion under inconsistent bounds. In fact, we're only going to prove subtyping inversion in the empty context, that's really all we need to prove type safety. If you like what you saw, there's a lot more in the paper. And finally, we have mechanized the entire meta theory in ACTA, and the source code is available as an artifact from Zenudu. That's it for me. Thanks for staying with me until the end. And I also want to thank Paolo, my co-author, and all my colleagues that made this paper possible. Cheers.